Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I'll be your Gaming Monk for the evening. Let's talk about conversion. Two months ago, when I covered Star Frontiers as part of TSR Month, I argued that Buck Rogers in the 25th century should have been used as a second edition of Star Frontiers rule set instead of the hacked version of AD&D they did use. I argue this not just because of the fact that it'd be good resource management with the company, but also because not all rule sets are created equal. While most RPG systems can be fairly flexible, especially with house rules, unless you're dealing with a purely universal system like GURPS, that flexibility is going to have its limits. The common retort I often hear is house rule it, but I personally believe that house ruling should be a spice, not the main dish. You wouldn't dump ketchup on a steak like it's going out of style, would you? In the same vein, you're not going to shift from the default Tolkien melting pot to a space opera. There are certain baked-in traditions with the former that you're going to have to change if you're going to be going with the latter. Big changes, in fact. It's for this reason that I prefer so-called neo-clones over retro-clones. These games understand that the system needs to bend in order to accommodate the new approach. Especially, as I said before, some baked-in parts might not be as compatible. This brings us to Stars Without Number, a BX D&D neo-clone that took a life on its own with time aiming more for a space opera instead of high fantasy. Now, I will note that I'm covering the Deluxe Revised Edition in this review, for reasons you'll see momentarily. How does it hold up? Well, let's find out. Now, the Deluxe Edition runs at about 325 pages and keeps things fairly consistent with a black-and-white theme. While the text is a little small for my liking, the book keeps things well-organized and goes out of its way to keep the reader from getting confused. Chapter jumping is kept to a minimum, which is definitely something I appreciate. The main difference between the deluxe and the free versions is that the latter adds several new chapters of content, some of which we'll tackle through this review. Last, but certainly not least, we have an index. Character creation has a very old-school mindset, but the revised version has some tweaks. We'll be exploring this with a gun for hire named Sinclair Boson. Step 1 is Attributes. Much like other D20-style games, this is generated with a roll of 3d6 six times and assigned in order, after which you can turn the lowest score into a 14. After generating ours, we land with the following results. Strength 18, Dexterity 17, Constitution and Intelligence 16, Wisdom 14, and Charisma 12. Deriving from this is our hit points and saves. Our starting HP is 9, and our saves are Physical 13, Evasion 14, and Mental 14. Step 2 is Background, your career of sorts before taking the adventuring life. This grants us level 0 in a set of skills. We'll be going with Soldier, granting us any two combat skills, Exert and Survive. We'll be going with Shoot and Stab for our combat skills. Step 3 is Class, of which there are four to choose from. Warrior, Expert, Psychic, and Adventurer. The first three occupy the Warrior, Rogue, Mage trinity while the last is a hybrid of two of the aforementioned trinity. We'll be going with the warrior in our case, granting a free level in a focus, the ability to redo an attack once per scene, and plus two hit points. Step four is focus, which is akin to knacks, perks, and so on in other games. Foci tend to have only two levels, and we gain one foci for free and another combat-related foci for being a warrior class. We'll go with level one in gunslinger and sniper. This grants us the ability to draw ranged weapons as an on-turn action, i.e. a free action, and roll with advantage on execution actions with ranged weapons, i.e. roll 3d6 and drop the lowest. We also increase our shoot and stab skills to level 1, as well as take the notice skill at level 2 as our free skill pick. Step 5 is equipment. Instead of going with the random roll for equipment, we'll go with the soldier package that's included. This grants us a combat rifle, knife, woven body armor, backpack, compad, and 100 credits. Character creation is certainly fine, although some of the calculations made me tilt my head. I do like that there's ways to optionally streamline the steps each part of the way, with a detailed and quick version of character creation, and in some parts right in the middle. The real issue I had was with advancement. Using skill points to advance skills or attributes in this manner is never something I've been fond of in level-based games. 
It's mostly the fact that you're using the same resource for multiple advancement types. That's something I prefer in games that have a more freeform approach. Here, you have a limited version of that same resource. The method in which HP increases is doubtless going to rub some the wrong way as well, as it's not a steady increase, but instead a dice roll. A net positive, but with some oddities. I would be remiss if I didn't mention some of the character creation alternatives. Firstly, the transhuman chapter, which is all about campaigns that have undergone some kind of singularity. In addition to having a new currency system, it also has a reputation system called Face. More specific to character creation is a shell mechanic that allows PCs to have one or more bodies they upload into. Second, while Stars Without Number is aiming for gritty sci-fi, there's an option for heroic characters that are more larger than life than the typical ones. This manifests through a higher ability generation in the heroic character rules. The highest possible HP with each level, and new foci at every even-numbered level instead of its standard approach. In a manner of speaking, the heroic characters are a halfway point between the normal Stars Without Number rules and the previously reviewed Godbound, right down to using the Fray die. Lastly, true AI creation. This can be considered akin to droid creation in the Star Wars RPGs, especially Saga Edition. But in Stars Without Number, this acts as both race and class, with a partial variant for those who are playing in the adventure class. But we're not done with creation just yet. Now it wouldn't be a space SF without some ships, would it? So Stars Without Number comes with a ship creation system. The Deluxe Edition has a mech creation system as well, but creation of that acts similar to a ship creation, so I'm not covering it quite here. Now this is done in three steps and ranges from fighters to full-on stations. We'll be making a simple fighter craft called the Knife. Step one is to choose the hull type, the base model of the ship. We'll go with Strike Fighter in this case, which grants a 16 armor class, 5 armor, 5 speed, 8 hit points, 5 power, and 2 mass. Step two is fittings, the weapons, defenses, and support upgrades to a ship. In addition to the highest class of hull that can be utilized, it's important to bear that these have a cost in power and or mass. Now we'll go with atmosphere configuration and a multifocal laser. A fairly straightforward approach, though I could see some bigger vessels being daunting. Thankfully, there's a set of baseline ships provided that can be built around. Stars Without Number likes to use D20 for combat and, oddly, 2D6 for skills. In either case, it's typically a roll-high affair. While most of combat in Stars Without Number is standard fare for D20-based games, in part by design since Crawford wants you to integrate this with your other BX retro clones, combat in Stars Without Number is significantly more lethal. This is accomplished through a combination of high weapon damage and HP values that are relatively low. After all, our starting character here only has 9 hit points. Making this even more tricky is the Shock Rule, a kind of win for losing wherein melee attacks that miss can still inflict a minimum damage if the target's armor is low enough. For example, a stun baton that misses will still inflict one damage as if you rolled a one, plus the attacker's ability modifier, either strength or dexterity, if the target has an armor class of 15 or less. It's a nice way to add risk to melee combat, and to demonstrate that a swarm of primitives can still overrun your fancy armor if you're not careful. Ship combat has a flair that might invoke a few cliches from Star Trek fans, given that each PC in a large enough ship can be assumed to handle a type of action. Bridge, Captain, comms, engineering, gunnery, and general actions. This is a little tricky for smaller ships, but not impossible. An interesting twist is the fact that there's a cooperative action economy called command points. Actions such as do your duty and above and beyond can add command points to a shared pool that are used by other departments. Further adding to the Trek feel is the concept of ship crises, which can be used as an alternative to taking damage. Ship combat is good as presented, but it does seem to have an inbuilt assumption that you have several PCs managing departments in one ship. Either way, the system still maintains the high lethality on-ground combat has. In addition, you have suggestion tables for creating mecha, sectors, encounters, factions, societies, as well as a conversion guide for the original Stars Without Number that make this game quite the sandbox. Now in many SF sittings, Psionics is treated as the equivalent of magic, mechanically speaking. The Deluxe Edition adds to this with more traditional magic systems, and we'll tackle both here. First, Psionics, known in setting as MES, or Metadimensional Extraversion Syndrome, 
is an extension of Stars Without Numbers skill system. Each subtype of psionic powers is assigned a skill. Biopsionics, metapsionics, precognition, telekinesis, telepathy, and teleportation. Each level of the skill grants one technique, with level 0 granting the skill's core technique that upgrades as you level up in the skill. Beyond that, these powers are fueled by effort, which is generated by the psychic's level, wisdom or constitution, whichever is higher, and the highest psychic skill. Much like in Godbound, effort is not spent, but rather committed. In addition, you can cheat and get a free point of effort through torching, which runs the risk of losing a point of wisdom and or constitution, based on a d6 roll. Alternatively, the space magic chapter gives an approach that's more designed to integrate spell lists from other games. They specifically name drop Labyrinth Lord and this sort of thing to give kind of an idea of what you're dealing with. As such, it doesn't necessarily have a spell list here. Even with that conversion, it is still rooted in a skill, in this case magic though you could possibly add more skills for magic spheres if you so wanted. Furthermore, magic effects are divided between spells and invocations. The difference between the two boils down to slow preparation versus quicker ones. In addition to casting centric foci, the space magic approach introduces three classes. The Arcanist, Magister, and Adept. The Arcanist is akin to a generalist wizard. The Magister is akin to a sorcerer, allowing them to cast more often and the Adept is akin to spell-like classes like a Cleric or a Warlock. I've seen some call this game Basic D&D Meets Traveler. I kinda see that if I squint at it, but I feel that sells it short. Stars Without Number is another expression of what Crawford does best. He's very good at presenting his games as toolkits under the widest umbrella possible. The theme of gritty SF is the central pillar of Stars Without Number, but it doesn't see itself as the true way to run it. The expansions that have come out for the original and revised seem to reinforce that wide umbrella nature that the game has. Now, accessible is a dirty word these days, but that's something that I find applies here, and I do appreciate how it's implemented. The game goes out of its way to show its customizability in rules and story seeds for the GMs. A few dice rules can easily provide the foundation for short and long-term play. Now, Revised might have shifted away from the old-school narrative a bit, but I'm fine with it since it's service to a stronger identity. As such, I can give Stars Without Number a stamp of strongly recommended. Even if you're not a fan of retro clones, there's plenty here to tinker with and make the game your own. There's a few minor quirks, like the use of 2d6 and skill rolls, that I don't quite understand, and I might adjust that personally, but the full package is far from lacking in potential. Get on the Deluxe Edition if you can, but the free version is no slouch either.